So the next slot that we have is a plenary panel. So when we were deciding putting together what we were going to do for this conference, we noticed there'd been a trend. A few years ago, we had a lot of representatives from industry, from things other than academia here. And kind of that audience has slightly shrunk over the last few years. And we thought, what can we do to try and promote that again and make people recognize there are careers in research software engineering outside of the university? And we thought, let's put together a panel of people who are doing research software engineering outside of universities. And as it happened, uh, our, our panel chair had submitted a, a panel to discuss exactly that. And we thought, okay, perfect. We can ask you to chair this panel and make it plenary. So um, I, will, I will start off by introducing our panel chair. Uh, so our panel, panel chair today is Hannah Williams. Hannah is a mathematical modeler at the UK Health Security Agency. She became involved with the RSE community through the SSI Fellowship Programme in 2021 and has supported the creation of a software community of practice at UKHSA, which seeks to improve collaborations and working practices across the organization. So Hannah has prepared a short video to introduce the topic that we're going to be discussing today in the panel. Uh, that video is going to be narrated by Peter Schmidt. So I'm... <laughs> Okay, hello everybody. And it's more or less a slideshow, so don't get away excited if it's uh, actually not exactly a video. So it's a video in slow motion. Let's put it that way. <laughs> and we're going to start. So during ne during Neil's keynote on Tuesday, a question was asked. And would you agree that the community society has a responsibility to offer examples of diverse roles exactly to encourage participation and broaden the model. Neil said yes. <laughs> and here's one we prepared earlier, and I think this is where the music kicks in. Research Software Engineering Beyond Universities, which is the panel that we're going to have in just about a second. And here are some of the roles um, that we have, introducing some of your peers. Industry and commercial. Research software engineer, Diamond Light Source Limited. Community manager, Talarafi, Talarifi, Talarifi, Talarifi. Talarifi, thank you. I'm terribly sorry. Research solutions architect, Amazon Web Services. In government, we have research software engineer, British Library. We have Senior Principal Scientist, Defense Science and Technology Laboratory. In Government National Lab, UK Atomic Energy Authority. Uh, research Software Engineering Group Leader. A Research Software Engineer. Uh, in Public Industry Met Office. Uh, Foundation Scientific Software Engineer, Atmospheric Disper Dispersion and Air Quality. <clears throat> Public Industry Met Office, Research Software Engineer, Research... Oh, la la la, Public Engineer, Foundation... Foundation Scientific Software Engineer, Foundation Scientific Software Engineer again, Scientific Software Engineer, Data Scientist in Government UK Health Security Agency. We have quite a few. We have Head of Data Engineering, Head of Scientific Computing, Principal Geospatial Data Scientist, Deputy Director for Performance and Operational Analytics, Health Economist, Modeler, Team Manager, HPC Cloud and DevOps, Data Provision and Acquisition Lead Analyst. In academia, well, we have Research Software Engineer for HPC at the Forschungszentrum Jülich, uh, Research Software Engineer, University of Manchester, Computational Scientist, National Center for Atmospheric Science, Specialized Senior Technician, Instituto de Astrofisica de Canarias. Well, it's multilingual. And Community Lead and Portfolio Manager in University of Manchester. The National Institute, the Alan Turing Institute, has the Program Manager, Research Application Manager, Senior Research Software Engineer, Director of Research Engineering, Research Data Scientist, Charity National Oce Oceano Oceanography Center, I'm sorry about the pronunciation, is the Senior Research Software Engineer, a research software engineer, the National Laboratory, Mathematical Research Software Engineer, Science and Technology Facilities Council, 
research software engineer ISIS neutron and muon source, research software engineer science technology facilities council, e-science research engineer Netherlands science center, research center under natural environment research council, the British geological survey, HPC manager and systems engineer, computing officer, geomagnetism scientific support and IT specialist, geomagnetic data analyst, IT specialist, international organization, European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasts. We have the head of integrated forecast system, the scientist for machine learning, and, okay, media education podcaster, research software engineer and freelancer, uh, membership organization, community manager at Asia Research Software Alliance, nonprofit senior analyst, research software digital research alliance of Canada, Intergovernmental Organization Machine Learning Engineer, EMBL, EBI, I'm not going to spell out what the acronyms mean, and Research Institute with Charitable Status, Research Software Engineer, the James Hutton Institute. Thank you to all who contributed to profile and to Peter Schmidt for providing the voiceover, even though I stumbled over a few words, and I hand over to the panel. So we've got five panelists in front here, and we've got Tanya who's joining online. Um, so. Ed introduced the, the reason for the panel um, and uh, uh, RSE, Lon uh, RSE London network meeting a few months ago. Tanya had a really good um, sort of uh, term that captured sort of other RSE roles, um, not necessarily called RSE, as you saw from the non-exhaustive uh, list on the, on the slideshow there. So we'll start with introductions and we'll go with Tanya because she's going to sort of explain the term RSX. Oh, hi. Um, hi, everyone. I am Tanya. I am the director at OneSet Labs, and I've been tasked with introducing a term that we've been using internally at OneSet Labs. Um, that is RSX, or um, Scientific X. Well, Scientific X people. Um, this is mostly to recognize that software sustainability and community sustainability requires a lot of different skills and a lot of different expertises. So. Um, by using the term like RSX, we are trying to recognize that and recognize all of these different folks and skills that, are, that play an essential or a significant role in research or research-related software activities. Um, so that includes people like research software engineers, research software, uh, research software designers, uh, project managers, community managers, um, developer experience people. So. I think that makes it a lot more inclusive and it also opens up, well, for us, it has been very useful to also open up our career progression and recognize and incentivize the correct set of skills and behaviors that we expect to see across all of these different roles. Thank you, Tanya. And over to our in-person panelists, Adam. Uh, so I'm uh, Adam Hill. I'm uh, currently a senior data scientist at a private company called Comply Advantage, which works in uh, financial regulation compliance, um, but I'm also a core community volunteer in Amongst Data Kind UK, which does uh, pro bono charity linking of commercial and academic data scientists out to third se sector organisations to facilitate their access to that skill set, which they often cannot afford in the traditional sense, uh, as well as my extra hat. I'm a former Royal Society entrepreneur in residence, bringing industrial links and skills back into the academic environment to bring in different training atmospheres. And as much as that role has formally ended, my uh, visiting status at the University of Southampton is still alive and kicking. And so I get involved in training and other aspects there as well. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Emma Hogan. I'm a senior scientific software engineer at the Met Office. Um, I have a background in astronomy, so I did a PhD at the University of Leicester many years ago, and then I got a job at Gemini Observatory in Chile, uh, where I was a data process developer and developed software for astronomers to process um, data from the, oh, sorry, thank you, um, data from the telescopes, and then, yeah, look, looking to move back to the UK and now I help climate scientists process their data, so. 
Hello, everybody. Um, uh, I'm Emily Jefferson. Uh, I'm uh, currently the CTO at uh, a UK-wide virtual institute called Health Data Research UK. Um, prior to that, well, I did a, a postdoc um, uh, as an RSE in, in bioinformatics uh, quite a few years ago now. At some point, I sold my soul and went and worked in the finance sector and uh, trading systems and things for banks. Uh, gave my soul back by cycling around the world. Um, came back again to, into uh, into academia to work in sort of um, health uh, data again with a bit of a mixture between pure academic and kind of professional services in, in universities. Uh, fought against the fact that there was a bit of a, a ceiling in terms of if you're wanting to do RSE work for, for career development and decided to become a, a proper grown-up academic, which I'm still not really. Um, and then um, uh, that worked quite well for a little while. And then I've moved on to uh, secondment at HDO UK as, as their CTO. Hi, I'm James Byrne. I'm with the British Antarctic Survey as a research software engineer. Um, previously, I was a software developer and DevOps uh, engineer in industry. So I used to work in uh, a mixture of organizations around telecoms, uh, the finance sector, and then I got uh, I got, I lived the dream and went to Antarctica for a long time and worked down there as basically a sysadmin. And then they started to institutionalize me and I've been happily uh, treading that path ever since. So. Hi everyone. Um, just what a pleasure it is to be here. So thank you for, for having me. My name's Arthur Turrell. I have to start with the usual boring disclaimer that I'm here representing my own views, not those of the Bank of England or um, the UK government, uh, which gives you a clue as to where I'm working. Um, so um, I started out in physics, in the physics department at Imperial College, but since 2015, I've been working in the public sector in a variety of roles. So I had the great pleasure of directing the UK public sector's largest team of data scientists at the Office for National Statistics. And uh, now I manage researchers and data scientists at the Bank of England. And as well as that, on the side, I'm very passionate about um, helping people learn to code and about creating tools. So I have um, some, pa some Python packages and some training materials. So you can check out the Python package SkinPy and uh, Coding for Economists as well, an online learn to code book for economists. Thank you. So we have a few pre-prepared questions. We also have Slido. Um, if you don't ask questions, I've got more pre-prepared questions. So if you want your points addressed or answered, um, please do make use of, use of, of Slido. So our first question, we're sort of doing this fairly quick fire. The hope is that we expose you to different people, different profiles, different types of work, and then you can carry on the discussions over the rest of the conference or over the rest of your careers, lives, etc. So I'm not sure what there is beyond that. But, uh, so we will start with, sorry. <laughs> What, what level of freedom do you have over your work regarding what you do and how you do it? So we're going to start with Tanya. Um, I have a lot of freedom. I, I think I am very privileged in that sense. We, well, the, the way we conduct business in one side, we basically have a consultancy side and then our not-for-profit side, that is the side of the organization that I direct. And we, have the pleasure of for me it's an absolute joy just to work in open source maintaining a lot of the foundational open source projects so for on that sense we have a lot of freedom because we a community and like all the community dictates what needs to be happening in that project it's not us dictating exactly what has to go into a project so that gives us a lot of freedom um that helps us balance our interests there and on the consultancy side, we are usually given also a, a lot of freedom in terms of technology, making choices. Um, we normally, or I would say 99% of the time, we favor open source tools, open source infrastructure, and we also apply for a lot of grants. So that also gives us a lot of additional freedom and decision power in what we want to focus our efforts and our resources in. Thank you, and Adam. So, I mean, it's an interesting question. In So, I, as I said, I, I'm a senior data scientist in a company called Comply Advantage. So I am at the mercy to a degree of what the business needs or what our customers need. 
But in that space, we're free to innovate and solve whilst also knowing what the the general mission of the business is. And so it, one of the key things actually, certainly within the data science team, is to actually still come up with our own ideas because product managers don't always know exactly what they should be doing for innovations. And so it very much leans back into almost a traditional scientific context of what might make this better, what would work well, uh, which is why we encourage everybody within that team to actually be very uh, cross-organization involved to be having conversations with everybody in different parts of the business because the only way you know what's what the, all the moving parts are to actually figure out where to innovate um obviously there are still constraints at the level that it has to deliver some kind of business value and be deemed worthwhile spending time on but we try and split time between longer term research projects as well as immediate things that need fixing or have answers that need uh to be brought together and we're fairly free in our technology choices. We tend to be working still, certainly all the data scientists and a lot of uh, the software engineers and the data engineers are all working in that Python ecosystem. Um, if it was something very radical and new that wasn't being widely supported, then we'd probably have to get a little bit of sign-off because if it's ever going to end up in production, as everybody I'm sure in this room knows, someone's got to maintain it and make sure it carries on working. And so therefore you've actually got to make sure you don't let everything free and wild but if you can make a case for it and you can argue why that, that is the appropriate way to do it then you've got a good shot at getting that stuff through so there's there's a lot of freedom in, within a defined scope let's say yeah actually i'm gonna say this, that met office is relatively similar to that actually so we have you know dedicated teams um that have a specific purpose um and specific goals and outcomes um so kind of within a team there's not that much freedom because your team is there to work work on a thing um but then within the team i think there's a little bit of freedom like i've had discussions with my line manager to say oh, i really like the look of this project could i you know maybe get my foot in the door on that and and you know that will be taken into account and then we you know we kind of get choices on what we work on um typically languages um obviously our, our model's written in fortran um a lot of the scientific work that we do is written in python um and so we have the freedom at that level so when we're developing um we can we, we've got freedom to do kind of what we want um so long as we're delivering what the like the output of the team and we're and we're delivering what we're meant to be delivering so um uh, yeah, we also have a, a huge amount of freedom. Um, so I suppose uh, the, the the key thing is if you're developing any software, what do the users need and want? So you're always going to be constrained by that in whatever industry you're 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 in, um, because you know you need to provide software that is actually used and um, and helpful to 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 whatever ever it is. But we very much have a open source um, is generally uh, uh, first. We try to assemble or reuse things out there uh, rather than rebuilding things from from scratch. But have a huge choice in terms of the tech stack that um, that we use, but also in terms of kind of um, where we can go off and 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 research a cool new way of doing something, we very much try to to, to do that as well. Um, when I when I first came into Post, we had quite a few people who were very or everybody was very much from a pure um, industry background rather than an RSE um, background, and we actually brought in quite a few people to balance up the team so that we got pretty much sort of half of the developers are are from industry and half of them are, are more from a, a sort of a, an academic or or traditional. Um, RSE background and that's really strengthened the team in terms of bringing in the sort of best of both worlds um, and that's kind of helped the the, the creativity and um, and the innovation in the space. Yeah and uh, I mean I'm, I'm going to echo what others have said actually the important thing for us is that we have numerous stakeholders so we do research and we do operations and then we have to deliver as part of our remit um, uh, so uh, some level of impact so whether that be uh, social or uh, scientific or wider community impacts and i think that actually i'm going to sort of like then slightly pivot and say that does restrict your freedom slightly because you you have to ultimately guarantee that people are safe people are benefiting and people as you described can maintain whatever it is you build there is still flexibility in that and ultimately science is part of our goal so um if if you want to write something in idl and that's the what everything else is written in then we're not going to embark on a massive project because we're only just building the software engineering function within these centers so 
um yeah there's there's an interesting balance to be struck i would say you can't just be completely free to do whatever you want and i think once you understand that balance and understand your stakeholders needs then you'll you'll be all right and you'll feel free <laughs> so um i think you know what, what's really important in the public sector is coming back to outcomes so are you actually improving how uh, the public sector works are you actually do, doing better for your citizens and I think generally most institutions are willing to give quite a lot of freedom within that remit as long as you can tangibly demonstrate that your approach whatever it may be um, is ultimately going to lead to kind of better outcomes then then you can make a good case um, and you know the, the work at the office for national statistics was incredibly varied and there's incredible freedom about what what projects to take on Typically, you know, our staff who were largely data scientists uh, at the data science campus, uh, unsurprisingly, um, would um, work up a pitch with some people from, say, a local council, from another government department, um, even sometimes from other governments, um, and kind of pitch it to the management of the campus. And then we would kind of, uh, in an open meeting uh, that anyone in the campus could come to, we would kind of pick through the kind of benefits and outcomes that it was trying to achieve. And um, we kind of left it to the data scientists to decide what tools were best. Now, all of those things about sustainability and kind of what um, what technology is actually going to last well in the long run and kind of, um, you know, the fact that some things are just more commonly used outside the world, all, all factor in. They're, they're definitely part of the consideration. And the other thing at the campus is that we tried to open source as much as we could. Some things it's just much more difficult because the question being asked was more sensitive. Um, but wherever we could, we tried to open source things. Now, having said there was lots of freedom, the, the thing that there was less freedom on, or there is less freedom on in general in the public sector, is um, platforms and programming languages and things. And that's partly because we're often dealing with a legacy of kind of enterprise IT that is um, old, clunky, um, and not always particularly, I'm afraid to say, well thought out. Um, so, so there is that backdrop, um, and it varies massively across the public sector, but that can be a, a difficult constraint to work under. Um, so I, you know, obviously in, in my role there, I was trying to help other departments improve what they were doing in this space. And one of the things they often ran into was that their data scientists often couldn't even install Python. You know, I, I won't name the very large important department I have in mind here um, but um, it, it was quite worrying because they kept trying to hire data scientists and they'd last about six months and then they'd leave because frankly they, they just couldn't really do anything and you know proper software engineering was just way beyond uh, what they were able to do um, so that is a constraint um, but I'm happy to say it's one that's starting to kind of I think we're starting to win the battle on as more places dot cloud and that kind of gives a, a kind of escape from kind of enterprise like IT systems and, and their vagaries. Um, and the other thing is the data. And in the public sector, some of the data that we handle is incredibly sensitive. And we have such a duty of care to the people that it is attached to. So, you know, be it health records or kind of financial transactions and um, to, you know, the kind of uh, the reputation and kind of sanctity of the institution as well, you know, because um, ultimately ONS is there to provide impactful insights that politicians can act on, but it can't do that legitimately or, or well if if there are things like data leaks. So, um, you know, the, the security levels of the systems involved, and it's the same at the bank too, are the primary concern in, in kind of everything. And that does impose extra constraints, you know, um, having said that, if it was public data, then, in, for instance, in the campus, um, we just gave everyone a fully spec MacBook and said, off you go, do, do what you like. Um, but by the time I left, I'd say like 98% of the projects people were choosing to do in, in Python and SQL. I can Sorry, talk about I'm going to have to stop you there. <laughs> Thank you. So we're going to go for a quick fire question. So challenge to the panellists is uh, answer this in less than five words. Um, how is your work funded? Tanya. Customers, grants, partners, our, so, um, that's it. Thank you. Uh, customers and investors. Mostly government. Uh, mostly a range of grants. Using the public's money. <laughs> By taxpayers. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for those uh, concise answers. So um, we're going to deviate a bit from the pre-prepared questions because I can see a lot coming in on pay, which is a very important you know, topic to cover. And we are going to go there. I have prepped, prepped these people, these lovely people for this question. Um, essentially, question that people want to know when they're applying for jobs is how much are you paid? Um, and it's not always open or easily findable on job adverts. So can you give us an idea of your pay ranges within your organization or your sector? And we are not asking you for your specific salaries. If we want to make that clear, <laughs> that would be a bit unfair. Um, so we'll start with Arthur. Right, hello. Okay, so the great thing about the public sector is it's incredibly open uh, about salaries. Um, so um, the entry level kind of data scientist role where you might be doing some um, RSE as well at the data science campus is 37K. Um, and I should have prefaced this by saying that obviously in the public sector, wages do tend to be lower than in, in the private sector. Um, now, the other thing is that there are training programs. Normally you have to pay to do a tra training like masters or whatever. But at the campus, we had a deal where we would pay you to work for us, but we would spend two or three days a week training you for two years as well. And um, that's paid at about 31K. The most senior you can be in the civil service and, and still, you know, probably have hands-on coding time, but I'll be honest, not very much, um, that pay is about 61K. One of the things I tried very hard to do um, with my colleagues in, in uh, 10DS, the number 10 data science team, was introduce a bit more of a, um, a second tier as well as the management kind of career progression, a data science career pro progression where we ha could have technical data scientists. Um, but uh, a large department who I also won't name, um, it kind of stopped us. But I think it is important that in the future, this, this is thought about very seriously in the civil service. And at the bank, basically, at the moment, the, the, the salaries for data science is a little bit in flux. So I don't want to give uh, certain figures, but it'd be slightly more than um, at ONS. So we're actually similarly very open. So we're on the UK uh, pay band. So you'd probably be looking at band C to E. And I don't know the figures off the top of my head, but that could be very junior roles would be somewhere in the region of 20K, 25K maybe, um, up to, you know, sort of 40 plus K. Um, there, I believe, was a freeze on the band progression. So like the bands are actually quite wide. So you weren't necessarily able to progress within the bands, but I believe that's going to be addressed by UCRI at some point. Um, as I say, that's very open, and I'm talking about RSE level roles. So once you go into management, then you might be looking at bands above that. Um, again, I don't have all figures to hand, and I don't really want to mention them. <laughs> so, yeah, hopefully that's helpful. Um, yeah, so we have quite a bit more flexibility um, as a, a national institute, so we're not sort of tied into the kind of standard academic grades that you would see in in um, uh, in, in a lot of universities. Um, so we again have open open banding. We 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 we, we um, uh, that that's that's available for for people to see when when we put the job adverts out there. Um, so a junior grade would be anywhere between sort of uh, forty to to. 60 65 mid where you're you know really quite a, a senior uh, person would be more around 50 to 70 tops of, of sort of 75 and then very much more, moving more into the sort of management grades but maybe still doing a bit of um, hands-on coding somewhere between um, uh, 70 and about 90. Um, so the Met Office is part of the civil service, um, so our pay grades roughly align to, to those within the civil service. I think numbers have already been mentioned, so I probably don't need to repeat them. Um, I guess one of the things that uh, at the Met Office that, and my opinion, um, is that it's not all just about pay. Uh, we get a lot of benefits as well. Hold that thought. Fine. <laughs> um, and fine, I'll stop there then. <laughs> uh, so... Interestingly, uh, so at Comply Advantage, one of the things that's been championed internally is better pay transparency to make sure that when people are being hired in, everybody knows kind of nobody's being paid more. Nobody's done a really, really good job at the, at the pay negotiation to actually suddenly bump things up. And so it's being treated. We do internal reviews with other tech companies and we pay at the I think the 75th percentile is what we're looking at on average for any given job title. And uh at one point 
we were actually putting pay scales on job adverts explicitly. It's saying you will be paid within this range. And then a new head of HR, I think, readjusted the pay adverts or something. And it's all meant to be coming back. Um, but to give you context, if you came in as a, um, a junior, like graduate le uh, level uh, software engineer um, or a junior data scientist, you'd be looking probably at 40, 45K, sort of the lowest level. Um, those move up and they don't purely move up into um, managerial levels, kind of as I think um, Arthur was alluding to. We actually have individual contributor tracks that you can actually get quite senior on a technical level um, without having to go in and be managing people. But uh, those scales, they move up quite rapidly. So you are talking certainly when you get to uh, up into senior and staff level positions, you're talking six figure salaries that you're crossing into. Um, those things it's it's definitely from having been an academic and I went out to a startup I had a 50% pay rise on day one um, uh, the one counterbalance and I don't think I'm going to go into the benefits is pension contributions do matter they are smaller in the private sector so you will be taking some of that extra salary and putting it into your own private pension plan independently if you want to keep anything like what you get in um, in the public sector Tanya I would say particularly in my area, um, the ranges vary very, 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 very widely. We also operate in an area of industry in the not-for-profit. So we're a not-for-profit corporation, so it's very, very different to how many or traditional tech companies that are product-based or profit-based will calculate their salaries. We also are completely distributed, so we have to take into account location and seniority. Um, what I would say, like a starting range, like what has already been mentioned, around 40, 40k, let's say, something like that. Um, and then that just scales up based on seniority. We have the same approach of having a parallel individual and managerial tracks so that folks that don't want to go into management can still progress without having to resort, well, having to move on to management. And as I said, we also have the, all the other non-developer tracks to account for the diversity of skills. Um, yeah, but unfortunately in our area, it's just salary issues are very, very um, not unified. They're not standardized. There is a lot of variation. Thank you. And we're sort of going to combine a few questions that have popped up in Slido with a couple of the pre-prepared questions. So, um, uh, yeah, and then it's it's linked to this to this question up at the top. So I keep being told by real software engineers that I could be paid twice as much if I move to software developing engineering industry. Uh, is this true? That wasn't the question I meant to read. Sorry. <laughs> they keep switching around. Stop liking questions. <laughs> I, I can't keep track of these. There was one about. Um, essentially encouraging people to work in the public sector. Uh, and I wanted to sort of ask, ask the, the panelists about the sort of non-pay benefits um, that, you know, personally, I think are quite important where I work um, and might be different to what, to what people experience in academia. So Tanya, can you do a few, few words on, on that, please? Sorry, about the benefits. I, yes, I, I it's just sidetracked. Um, well, they're different. I would say like, the, the most significant difference tends to be when it comes to pension contribution uh, that has already been mentioned that tends to be lower. Right? So you have to make up for that individually. Then it depends also again, a, a lot of this depends a lot on the company itself. Um, we have a lot of very inclusive policies like very but it has taken that has taken a very very long time to build um where that like where that myth came from that benefits are pretty i suppose it also depends a lot of an experience like what you've been seeing in in your in well in your academia academic sorry experience versus what is specifically which company you've been working um that's again as i said there is so much variation it's not just salary but policies, flexibility, work-life balance, benefits in general, um, because a lot of that is very discretionary to, to the company itself and leadership and what they value. So 
I think that both have like good good things on that side. It is ultimately what works best for you in terms of work life balance, interest, um, values alignment, I would say. Thank you. So Arthur, can you keep your answer a little bit shorter, please? <laughs> and may, 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 okay. may, maybe touch on uh, the flexible working contracts um, and things like that would be good. Yes. Okay. So I'll try and do that. So I think there are four things. One is the non-contributory defined benefit style pensions, which are worth a lot of money. Everyone keeps talking about the pensions. So I'm going to talk about the other things, which I think are even more important. Um, the main thing is helping people. Um, you know, the public sector, you're really close to the coal face of actually helping people and improving people's lives. You know, and, and in the campus, that wasn't just true for the UK. It was true for governments around the world as well. We did loads of really interesting stuff, you know, counting cows from space in South Sudan. Um, just just helping people. I think that's such an important thing, Fe feeling like your work is meaningful. Um, Work-life balance, flexible working. Um, I think um, typically the civil service is good at this. Uh, and the bank is in excellent at, at this. So very generous parental leave, um, very understanding about people who need to take time out for, for whatever reason. And um, particularly, uh, you know, at the, at the campus, uh, we introduced a lot of um, very flexible working things. So almost totally re remote kind of turning up once a month kind of thing, um, but also just flexible hours as well. So if people wanted to do one or two days a week, um, unless there was an extraordinary reason not to, we made that happen. And the bank is very similar. And um, I think it's brilliant. I think um, I'm just going to echo a little bit, but um, the thing that comes straight to mind is positive change. You feel, as you were saying, Arthur, that you're making a positive change. Um, I've worked in a lot of different organizations, not only as a software engineer, but in other in other forms as well. Um, but the thing is, is in working for different organizations, like, um you can very much feel that you're passive and you're not able to actually affect any decent change whereas with the antarctic survey they will support you in making changes and that that is valuable uh yeah uh to echo making a positive difference i think actually just feeling like you know if you're going to work for however many hours in in a day you might as well do something that is making a positive difference in the world rather than necessarily just making money for, for for a company um i mean obviously it depends some companies do some absolutely fantastic products that also really make a difference but but you know if you to compare the the um uh the the sort of the general uh difference between those two i'd say that that's a, a significant difference um so yeah in addition to all the the great civil service benefits that have already been mentioned um at the met office uh we do get corporate bonus every year um, we have uh, what are called instant recognition awards where you can be awarded up to, I think it's like £250 uh, for things and that, that, that gets awarded to people fairly frequently. Um, we have like a cycle to work scheme. Um, we have lots of like retail shopping, like discounted retail shopping and like healthcare plans. We have really great annual leave benefits. Um, yeah, the flexible working so we we have all of that as well um you know we can offer things like compressed hours where you can maybe work all your hours monday to thursday and take friday off and those sorts of things just discussions with your manager um yeah the, the coming in once a month thing working remotely all the other time like that's that's okay to do at the metal office as well um and we also have a um because the met office recognizes that uh, RSE like roles are important we also get a market supplement at the moment it's temporary and reviewed on a yearly basis but we do get additional money uh, for that as well so uh, so obviously I'm as we've discussed I'm, I'm in the private sector and but the, some of the benefits that I'll, I'll mention are ones that I know that other friends and colleagues have in other organizations um, as well so I get uh, volunteer days um, everybody in the company does so I'm allowed to give my time back to a charitable organization or a volunteer group for two days a year I'm also allowed to take several learning and development days this is one of them this year um, as well as my own um, budgets so that I can pay for training and choose things within reason um, but this also comes again in uh, post certainly in the post-pandemic world uh, our business is entirely hybrid based so we have a London office 
people are encouraged and there are social events put on to try and make sure people do come in and network but the required contact time is limited um so it can be people coming in once a month some people go in more often um we also do get technically unlimited paid time off although there are limits because you can't just disappear for a year unsurprisingly um but the idea is to take for that work-life balance is to take that pressure off you thinking you have to keep a count real count of exactly how many days off so if you need to suddenly take a day here or you need a break because you've just been working flat out you are encouraged to look after yourself in that space um there's the usual other things like private medical insurance and other things that kind of get folded in through those things thank you so going to the top rated question on slido how do we encourage people to take up public sector rsc careers when the pay is so low compared to industry and even university pay now. Um, I'll leave it up to you to decide whether the pay scales that people have provided compare with with your uh, you know with the university pay scales. Um, but maybe one of our public sector panelists would like to answer that. I think we need to convince people of the benefits that are not fiscal i mean that's the fundamental problem people get people join the antarctic survey not because they're going to make any money if you go to antarctica you actually get paid what's called an antarctic employment pool allowance which is even lower than our actual pay bands but you're not called an rse if you go down because you're not doing research that's to keep the lights on but then you're in antarctica i mean it's a once in a lifetime opportunity <laughs> so <laughs> you know if people are only in it for the money then they need I, I would argue perhaps slightly aggressively that they need to review their 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 barometer <laughs> <laughs> thank you so we're just going to go for one person answering the question and then if if people want to ask specific follow-ups then you can do in the breaks and the rest of the day so um one of the key reasons why many people work in academia is because they feel they are part of a public open global endeavor to increase human knowledge in industry, do you feel sullied by making money out of knowledge that should belong openly to everyone? Now, personally, I don't think we should maybe be projecting that onto our industry colleagues, um, but I'm wondering if anyone would like to address it. Tanya, I'm not sure if that's your area or we can skip over that one. Um, well, sorry. Yep. Sorry, for, for me, I would say no. Um, again, my, my organization works very differently to a lot of other industri industrial organizations or corporations because we're a not-for-profit. So we we conduct business according to like community values, community standards, ethical standards. So we, and we are still open sourcing and contributing and maintaining to existing open source projects. So in that sense, I don't feel like we are Keeping and well, we are actually not keeping anything to ourselves. We're not making money off the back of folks that are already working on maintaining maintaining open source because that's what we do. Like we are those folks, basically. Thank you. Um, and if you want to hear Arthur's answer, come see him in the break with a big cup of tea. It might be a long one. <laughs> um, so the next one is there really a big difference between academia and industry? Is it actually an artificial difference created by ourselves? Now, would one person like to take that? I can comment on it because I spent nine years as a research academic and the progression as you're going up and you become a senior researcher, at the point where you're getting a permanent position in academia, you are not a pure researcher anymore. You are a manager of groups and grants and funds and doing a load of those roles. So the level of pure academic ivory tower freedom that often is that ideal of what is the academic world, I would say doesn't really exist anymore anyway, between teaching and just trying to keep the lights on. So stepping out into an industrial role, potentially, I mean, there is variety. That's the, that's the, the freedom there. There is still freedom to therefore doing innovative things and inquisitive things and research like things in those roles. So some of it is an artificial boundary, but yes there is a different focus because usually in that private sector unless you're in the third sector you are in the business of making some kind of profit to support a business versus pure knowledge potentially gain on the academic side so i think we've got five minutes left on the schedule yep yeah. so uh we're going to go to our last question and then if people answer it really quickly we'll try and 
get get through a few more of these. So um, I'd like to ask each of the panelists if there is one thing that they think happens in the in their sector, whether it's a tool or a practice or something else that they can see being of benefit to another sector. And if there's one thing that they think their sector or organization um, could could adopt. So Tanya, can we come to you first? I would say more holidays. Like that is one thing that I is like more holidays. That's it. Can you clarify which way that is? Is that you adopting more holidays or other? Oh yeah, sorry. Um I, in academia you definitely get a lot more holidays. Like the holidays over the winter are pretty much prescriptive. Um also because we work in a remote environment, we don't have anything like said bank holidays or things of the such. So that is very much for you to take into account into your annual leave um, allocation. Thank you. Pros and cons. Thank you. Uh, one of the things I've been really excited about to see in my current organization is that there's a relatively fast rate of innovation going on and change happening. And the team is growing. The company has scaled. It's already like 150 people more than when I joined a year ago. Um, within that, it means that every six weeks, the entire company comes back with, what have we been doing? Yeah. So you actually get very, um, it's very transparent, very open, so that it makes it easier to innovate because it's cross-disciplinary, it's cross-collaboration across the whole organization. And I think academia could learn to step out of their own departmental bubbles and things at times to actually help further and drive innovation across research as a whole. Um, I think a couple of things uh, for me. Uh, the Met Office, uh, I think one of the things we do well is we have sort of a quite clear and well-defined um, kind of progression system for 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 SSEs, um, which which I get the feeling that, that that's not quite as clear um, in academia. Um, we have a lot of emphasis at the Met Office on learning and development and training. Um, so, you know, we're, we're encouraged to kind of participate in things that will improve ourselves, um, which again, you know, you get this feeling from academia where it's like, you know, you have to work 200% of the time um, to, to get anywhere. Um, and it's kind of really the, the reverse, I would say, um, of the Met Office. Um, you know, you, we're, we're encouraged to, to work our hours, but, you know, we're encouraged to do a lot of learning development as well. Um, and then just uh, practices was the other thing I was going to say. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so a uh, major difference between academia and, and moving out to virtual institute um, is uh, the difference in the uh, amount of frustration by bureaucracy. So... Um, <laughs> Uh, in in universities, it, it can take you six months to a year to hire somebody and just the number of steps you have to go through and things. Actually, just being able to hire somebody in, in six months, uh, in six weeks from going, right, here's a job advert. It goes out the next day and somebody's in post. It's amazing. Um, and the other thing is recognition for people in terms of that that ceiling for technical uh, staff. So in a university, it's kind of viewed, uh, you know, that somebody is just like, ah, technical staff, that's somebody who fixes my computer and it's not actually recognized that that's like the you know a, 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 a software architect is the equivalent to a consultant in a in a hospital in terms of their level of expertise and knowledge and that's just not valued um in academia or really understood yet here yeah, yeah. here i think consist consistency and governance of digital infrastructure be it people or any other type of infrastructure yeah cool. so in terms of what i think of another sector could learn from the public sector i think one big change I noticed in going from academia to the public sector is in the public sector, people are often kind of pulling together in the same direction. Everyone's working together to try and get something done that's going to improve the world. And I think just the, the nature of academia and the fact that there are so few jobs and the kind of the structures and the, and the reward system don't always get the best out of people in terms of working together. Um, so that was a big difference I noticed. In terms of what the public sector could learn from elsewhere, I think there's a lot we can learn from frontier firms in the private sector um, in lots of ways, which you can find me about in the tea break. But I think one of the big ones is the use of the cloud as a kind of way to empower um, 
data scientists, software engineers, research software engineers, researchers, and to give them agency and to get them doing what they need to do in probably what is a safer way than on their institutional laptops. Cool, thank you. Um, so I think that's us now out of time. Um, it would be really great, I'm not sure if it's possible, if we can sort of save a copy of some of these questions that are on Slido. Mainly because they were really funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we just heard you giggling and not really sure what was going on behind. Um, it, yeah, it would be great if we could actually save those and maybe offline ask our, our, all of our panellists if they could give their comments. And then I don't know if it's possible to, to circulate those because I think it, I think it's been a really good discussion. It'd be great for you to, to continue. Um, and also things like where do you go to look for jobs? Like I think sort of oh yeah we're hiring always <laughs> <laughs> this wasn't intended to be a, a recruitment uh, but <laughs> so um there was another slide uh just to advertise the rsc journeys so if you are well wherever you are from um whatever your career has looked like so far the edi team is collecting uh, people's stories there will be a qr code maybe um otherwise go go talk to them at their stand there we go um so thank you to our panelists and hopefully chat to you all uh, uh, the rest of the day <laughs>